All right. Let's start the meeting of the panel on security. Items of item one on the agenda: confirmation of the minutes of the previous meeting, which was distributed to you on the twenty eighth of May. Up to this moment, the secretariat has not received any proposal for amendment to the minutes. May I ask whether there are any proposals for amendment now? If not, I suggest we have the minutes confirmed. Let's proceed to item two on the agenda: information papers issued since the last meeting. No information paper had been issued since the last meeting. Item three on the agenda: date of next meeting and items for discussion. May I refer you to the list of outstanding items for discussion. Any comments? Initially, the administration has proposed for discussion in July three items. Number one: public consultation on rescue drug testing scheme updates. Number two: contingency plan for nuclear incidents near Hong Kong. Number three: development of computer system for provision of post dispatch advice in the fire services department is actually a funding proposal. Now these have been suggested by the administration. Mr. James Toll suggested that we discuss. Training for police officers in the use of weapons. Maybe that's also a concern for us, Mr. Chen Kam Lam. Are you on this, Mr. Wong Yok Man? No, I have to go next door for another meeting, so I'm raising my hand to queue up for asking questions. Please invite the officials to come in, Mr. Chan Kam Lam, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any comment on the July agenda, but then, in the list of outstanding items for discussion, there's an item in relation to co-location arrangement for the XRL. I'd like to know when they'll be ready for an introduction. This was discussed. At the start of the XRL project, we all know that without co-location arrangement, the XRL will lose its major meaning. I don't think the arrangement can be made immediately. A lot of issues have to be discussed. So I'd like to know the inclination of the administration. Mr. Chan Kam Lam's item is already in the list of outstanding items for discussion. And today, from Mr. Dennis Kwok, I received a letter on the subject as well, and he'd like to have a meeting for discussion. I believe this is our concern. All along, I've asked that relevant government departments come for a discussion. I understand that overall speaking, the coordinator is the Transport and Housing Bureau. But I think we are all very concerned about the XRL projects under the THB. But there's another major issue. That is, from the viewpoint of security, we'd like to know the latest progress of low low co-location arrangement. So your concerns are noted. I'll try to find a time slot for that. I don't think we have any time for this subject in July. After receiving the letter from Mr. Dennis Kwok, I'll discuss with the administration to see when they can come as soon as possible for a discussion, or we can have a joint meeting. The concern is noted. All right. For the July agenda, any more? Under Secretary, just now we. Mentioned our list of outstanding items for discussion, and would like to discuss training for police officers in the use of firearms, in the use of weapons. We'll try to make an arrangement for a discussion, Mr. James Toe. 
Mr. Chairman, should this not be discussed in this month? Last time I suggested that this be discussed at this month's meeting. Which subject? The one that you just mentioned. You raised it, but you did not know. I suggested that we have a discussion this month. If not next month, and you're still consulting them. Well, we have to discuss with them. This is a broad concern. Well, we ha I request a discussion. This is imminent. It's for us to decide our own agenda. Why don't we have to discuss with them? Well, they have to discuss with us the items suggested by them. Well, after they have raised an issue, we'll try to ask them to come and discuss as far as possible, as soon as possible. Well, Mr. Chairman, we should discuss the issue this month. Don't consult any more. You don't need to consult the administration, Mr. Chairman. We're here to monitor the government. Well, we've heard you. We'd like to make a better arrangement. The arrangement is very simple. You don't need to consult them. From the viewpoint of arrangement, I have to consider a number of aspects. I have to discuss with the bureau to see which time slot is appropriate for discussion. I believe we've all heard you. All right, for agenda arrangements, any more comments? If not, yes, Ms. Emily Lau, Mr. Chairman, for our July meeting, if we are to add Mr. James Toe's subject, well, is it the 8th of July? Will it be at 4.30 p.m., the clock? Our next regular meeting will be held on the 8th of July at 2.30 p.m. Then we'd better have a longer meeting so that we can include Mr. James Toe's suggestion. Well, I've heard him uh, express our views very clearly to the Bureau. Well, even if they object, we should still proceed with the discussion. There's no reason for them to object. Dare they? Allow an empty seat here in this chamber. Will the chairman decide the overall arrangements for a meeting? Mr. James Toe, I fully note your request. All right? Concerning the arrangements for the July meeting, that will be the tentative arrangement. Let me remind you that on the 23rd of June in the afternoon, there will be a visit to the Government Flying Services to discuss their work situation. We mentioned this last time, and content suggested by members had already been relayed to the Security Bureau. We hope that members can participate in the visit. So this is a reminder. The visit will be held in the afternoon of the 23rd of June 2014. We'll start at 2.30 p.m. All right, let's proceed to item four on the agenda. Police's efforts in engaging the district community in crime prevention. The relevant paper is paper CB bracket 21621 stroke 1314 bracket 03. Perhaps I should first invite the Under Secretary to briefly introduce the paper to us. Under Secretary, Mr. Chairman, today I'd like to introduce to the panel how the police by engaging the district community and encouraging district community prevent crimes. In recent years, the law and order situation of Hong Kong has remained stable. The police effort is, of course, important, but members of the public, district organizations, and their collaboration with the police are also essential. Therefore, the police has always tried to unify 
efforts from all sectors of the community. With over, we have almost a hundred school liaison officers to serve the 1,100 primary and secondary schools in Hong Kong, and the junior police call is also providing physical fitness, discipline, and team building for young people as a means to boost their confidence and develop their leadership skills, self-discipline, sense of responsibility, and the spirit of serving the community. And there are dedicated activities for the elderly to enhance the communication between the police and the elders. For example, in the early part of this year, there is the Senior Police Corps Scheme implemented in 20 police districts with more than 2,300 participants. This is to disseminate the very important messages of uh, fight crime and we've invited community assistance to assist us. They're the non-Chinese speaking members of the public, and we have now more than 1,900 NEC JPC members. Our objective is to increase the number to 2,500 in five years. Besides, through multi-agency cooperation, like other government departments, property management companies, security guard organizations, etc., disseminate the fight crime message. And through multi-agency cooperation and different media and platforms, such as the police YouTube and the mobile devices for dissemination of messages will enhance interaction and communication. Recently, in Chinshui Wai Division, we've got the strategic direction on engaging the community, which was granted funds by the Yunlong District Fight Crime Committee. And within three months from June to September, we contacted over 10,000 households in 11 public housing estates. The scheme was completed in September. After collating our experience, we've proactively communicated with the public and organized all forms of activities for the public. And all these efforts are now included in the day-to-day -day efforts of the police. And our experience will also be incorporated in the policing work of other districts. So much for my report. Thank you. Thank you, Under Secretary. Who would like to ask questions? Mr. Wong Yukman, Mr. Um Long Singh, Mr. Chen Kam Lam. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Kwa Wai Kang. Mr. Wong Yukman, five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Well, maybe the police have been paying visits to the mainland many times in the past few years. Now, since they are quite mainlanders, when I read the paper, um, it's full of words. It seems that they have done a lot of things, but we do not get the details. For example, the police have um, sent school liaison officers to visit over 1,100 primary, secondary, primary and secondary schools in Hong Kong. But what actually have they done to disseminate the message um, uh, of uh, anti-crime? Well, in the past two years, I have also visited 100 to 200 schools. It was a very arduous task. I think I am the member that has visited uh, the most schools. And the police now are saying that they have visited over 1,000 schools. I think it is quite unbelievable. So can you tell us actually what they have done? Can we have um, the actual facts? Uh, they are giving us a huge amount of figures. So it's almost like the Great Leap Forward movement in mainland China. They just attached importance to quantity but not quality. Now, how about drug users in schools? Um, how about child activities in schools? Uh, has the situation been improved? Whether um, junior police call members have committed any crimes, etc. We have to know the actual situation in the different districts, and in particular in schools. We want to know the effectiveness of this police work. Now, because for our panel, we have the responsibility to monitor the police, and the police have to report to us. 
And that's another thing that I'm very interested in. I am also going to be an elder soon, and you have a senior police core scheme. So, will the elderly become smarter because of the scheme? Would they be less susceptible to deception? Will they be paying more attention to the household safety? So, can you give us actual facts? Now you have this senior police core scheme. What is the result of it? You shouldn't just give us figures, otherwise you are putting the um, horse before the uh, cart before the horse. And what do you mean by household policing plan? I would like to know more about it. And is it any different from the common practices um, on the mainland? They also have their um, street uh, security. Uh, People and it seems that these people in the neighborhood are actually trying to collect intelligence for the government. So would it be possible in Hong Kong as well? This is also my concern. So how are you going to build a close partnership with this, the district community, and what's the effect? Of the household policing plan, you say that many members are very concerned about this, but you have just given us a very simple report under secretary. You just gave us a very brief account of what you have done and If you want to encourage the engagement of the district community, the police have to take the lead. The police officers' attitudes are very important, and their behaviors are also important. So you shouldn't be acting like what the police officer did several decades ago. Lately, um, I have seen some examples. Now I have volunteers that have been going to different districts to distribute pamphlets on June 4th. And there have been interferences um, from police officers. Police officers have been asking our volunteers to uh, produce the ID card um, to show documents, etc. We were just distributing pamphlets. I didn't have to apply for a certificate of no objection from the police. We were just distributing materials on foot bridges, and the police officers were interfering with them. So, how can we cooperate with the police to fight crime? I think you are targeting us. Now, some of my political um, enemies may even call the police um, reporting on us, saying that we are using loud speakers. So we haven't committed any offenses, but the police officers were interfering with our work. Mr. Mlao Singh, with regard to paragraph two of the government's a uh, paper you say that Hong Kong um, is one of the safest city in the world, and um, you want to maintain that status. However, several days ago we have such a big news, and the special duties unit of the police had to be sent to the crime scene. So I would like to tell the other secretary that I really appreciate the work of the police. I think it um the police have done a great job in maintaining law, law and order in Hong Kong. And this should be a boost to the morale of the police. And with regard to paragraph four, and that's about junior police corps. I think the Junior Police Corps is a very useful tool for the dissemination of messages to young people. So for the Junior Police Corps TV program, has there been any change in um, the, its viewership? And lately we have seen the emergence of creative industry and some young people would like to make micro movies. So have you considered 
making micro movies. Maybe you can help young people to shoot micro movies. So, or you can host a competition so that young people can be encouraged to take part in such short film competitions and to help disseminate positive messages and also to raise people's awareness. So this is my the first question that I want to ask. Under Secretary, I would like to thank Mr. Ng with regard to the viewership of um, the junior police call. I do not have the figure at hand, but as far as I know, it is quite a popular program. When it's compared to other uh, TV programs, and it has enjoyed quite a good popularity, but I can um, get the exact ratings for you if you like. As for micro film, um, we have also done something in that regard. Maybe I can ask my colleague to tell you more about that later. But I would also like to take this opportunity to say this. Now we have been uh, promoting the engagement of um, district communities, and in the past few years, Hong Kong's overall law and order situation has seen a f further improvement. When we compare the um, crime rates of last year with that of the previous year, there has been a drop of uh, four percent. And when we compare um, this particular period with the same period last year, there has been a drop of 5%. So, of course, it is um, the hard work of the police and also the people's cooperation and support of the police are also very important. This is one of the results of um, district engagement. As for young um, substance abusers, According to our central data office, we have seen a significant drop in the figures as well. In particular, for young people, the drop has been more than 10%. Uh, this is also the result of district engagement. We have also been liaising with different schools through school liaison officers. We have held workshops and seminars. And I would like to ask Mr. Edwin Lam to tell you more about micro movies. Well, we have been using different platforms. In 2012, we have launched um, the Hong Kong Police mobile application, and in 2013, we launched a Hong Kong Police YouTube channel. We have uploaded a number of micro movies on our YouTube's, and earlier on, there were uh, messages concerning naked um, cats and uh, cruelty against animals. And with regard to the incident happened two days ago, um, would the household policy plan help? Yes, we think so, in particular in uh, big public housing as days building a good relationship with the residents is very important. Mr. Chen Kam Lam, Chairman, with regard to the crime rates, I am happy that there has been a significant drop, and this shows that the police have really done a good job. But I would like to ask the Under Secretary, in your paper. Um, you have been doing a lot of work for a long time. For example, for the Junior Police Corps, I think it has uh, been in existence for decades. So when we look at the modes of operation, it seems that there have not been much changes. Now, with the passage of time, maybe more elements should be added. For example, young uh, police. Uh, teams may be set up, we can encourage students in schools to take part in this. They can be like Boy Scouts, because I think young people are very interested in this kind of uh, military-like training. Now, if we can find young people who are interested in this regard and give them training, then this is a way of fighting 
crime, and we can also nurture um, young people. And we can um, teach them basic knowledge about fighting crimes. Maybe you can consider this. And also for um, the district fight crime committees and district work, how can the efficiency be enhanced? Uh, you are organizing a number of activities. You have been raising funds, etc. But you have been doing this uh, for a long time. So, uh, will you change your modes of operation? We should engage the communities more. So, for the DFCCs, um, they remain at a certain high level, and it and they always enforce dozens of people, and they are talking about the same topics all the time. So things have never been changed. Would the police have some other new thinkings? Thank you. And with regard to um, Junior Police Corps, yes, it has been um, in operation for many years, and it has uh, 180,000 members. There have been a number of changes. Well, it has a central committee, and it has invited uh, people from different districts to take part in this work. They can put forward their views and suggestions. Now, um, Mr. Chen Kam Lam's view is also very uh, good. Actually, for um, the advisors' views, we have taken many of them on board. For example, uh, for the age limits of uh, JPC, uh, we are now trying to raise the age uh, levels so that they can become senior members of the junior police corps. Although the JPC does not conduct disciplinary training through youth camps, as Mr. Jan said, Disciplinary lifestyle training and so forth are presented. I'll defer to Mr. Lam for an elaboration. Of course, can we have new ideas for the JPC? I'll hand this to the police to discuss with the DFCCs. In fact, in this regard, the FCC has always hoped that new activities could be organized. For those activities in which I participated, social media had been used. I also participated in a knock -off, in a kickoff ceremony. They would like to embrace more youngsters, and they would like to suit new lifestyles. As for more creative ideas, I'll defer to the please. I'd like to know how many more members would like to speak on this subject. Dr. Lam Tai Fai? Mr. Christopher Cho, altogether five at the moment. I have to conclude this item at 3.15 p.m., so I really cannot give five minutes to each member. If there's no more, I'll draw a line there, so four minutes each. Well, if we have more members, I can only give them one or two minutes each. Mr. Lamwaika, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The police would like to encourage the community to participate in district community in crime, crime prevention. The overall crime rates have dropped. And then here we see the police has presented us with breakdowns for dedicated work. Previously, we had the JPC. 
and more recently we had the Senior Police Corps Scheme, SPC Scheme. I think previously it got another name, and then we've uh, stepped up liaison with the NEC communities, and we also have social media and household policing plan. We welcome all these efforts. Prevention is always better than cure, so it's worthwhile for them to promote these activities. Just now, Mr. Wong Yok Man was concerned about the effectiveness of these efforts. Well, with 97 school liaison officers visiting 1,100 schools, so they've been working very hard. But I'd like to ask a question about the 19,000 visits to schools. How many officers were involved? You need 52 visits per day, even if all your officers are not to take leave throughout the whole year. So how much manpower and resources have you mobilized for this? You have to enter the school campus and have exchanges with the teachers and students before you can count that as one visit. How, how do you count one visit? It seems that the figure does not quite match the time. As regards online efforts, a few days ago I downloaded your apps, which are very rich. What's the frequency of updating? As for the case in Kaiching Estate, we're still t you're still talking about the aircon technician. And the day before yesterday, I didn't see that piece of news. So do you selectively update your information and how often you update your information? These are operational details that I'll defer to Mr. Edwin Lam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Concerning school visits, there are basically two main categories. For the first category, there are group discussions and on certain themes like uh, fight crime. Our colleagues talk to, say, a whole school hall of students. The second category involves personal chats, one-to-one -one personal chats. As for the updating of our information platform, it depends on the progress of the case concerned. We update the information therein as quickly as possible. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank him for the answer. But Mr. Lam, oh, I should ask the chairman. Just now we're told that there are group exchanges as well as one-to-one uh, -one exchanges. How did you arrive at this figure of 1,100 students? Well, if I have a group, I'll count the number of students in that group. But what about the visits, 19,000 visits? As for correct interpretation, allow me to go back and consult my colleagues. For the number of students, since they are one-to-one -one chats, the figure is accurate. But for the 19,000 visits, I really have to go back and consult my colleagues. At the moment, uh, with uh, 97 colleagues doing the work, so 97 officers conducting 19,000 visits, will 19,000 students appear more reasonable or logical, but 19,000 visits will allow me to go back and check. Mr. Lan Chi Chang and then Dr. Elizabeth Kwok. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Lung Chi Chang first. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I didn't hear you clearly. You called me. The police encourages public engagement in crime prevention. My colleagues and I are of the view that in recent years the police has been spending a great deal of effort on crime prevention. Hong Kong is one of the safest cities in the world. Just one or two projects would not attain that achievement. Other work projects were involved, like uh, 
work on young people, the elders, and households. I'd like to ask a question about the ethnic minorities. At the moment, in so far as crime rates are concerned, relatively speaking, have more ethnic minorities be involved in crimes? I don't have the statistics here. I'm more familiar with the Yunlong Police District. Very often, joint activities are organized with the ethnic minorities. They have in-depth contacts with the ethnic minorities, and sometimes uh, Chinese classes, lessons, were conducted, so the police also conducted those activities. Some colleagues asked whether or not household policing plan is actually a kind of intelligence work. I'm not so worried to communicate in depth with uh, the local communities is very important for the police. I don't think uh, there's uh, any hidden agenda. It's good for the police to contact households more. As for ethnic minorities, they play an important role in social stability and sense of belonging. In recent years, Relatively speaking, the police has been doing less work on the ethnic minorities. I hope that the police can step up its effort on this. May I go back to household policing? Our district very much support that. Mr. Lau, the district commander, is here. We've been able to check past records. At that time, I also participated in the household policing plan. Uniformed police officers visited households to understand their opinion and views on crimes in the district concerned. That's very important because it indicates that the police attaches importance to law and order, and members of the public also welcome the plan, which indicates the police emphasis on crime prevention. But after a few months, the plan was stopped. That's a pity. Can I just ask that you continue with the plan in Tin Shui Wai, Under Secretary? First of all, for ethnic minorities in liaising and assisting them to integrate into society, the police has not reduced its effort. But the police cannot control the frequency of media reports on those activities. Dr. Elizabeth Quart and then Dr. Lam Tai Fai. Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate the police effort in district crime prevention. Even for MACs, district liaison officers were sent to each and every MAC meeting to provide the latest statistics on crime prevention such that MACs can be reminded of the fight crime message. That's very good. I understand that many colleagues in the police volunteered to attend those meetings. I really appreciate them. As for junior police call, in the past we got more youngsters. Apparently, you have not been expanding the JPC. You mentioned sense of responsibility. You should boost your effort in that. Mr. Chan Kam Lam said that JPC could do more. It's more appropriate for the JPC to be involved in a team of cyber monitors, so to speak. This is related to the next subject because we now have more and more cyber crimes. If we just rely on the patrol teams of the police to do patrolling, it won't be enough. You won't be able to cover all cyber crimes. So for possible crimes and suspected problems, the JPC members can report to the police and reduce the number of fraud cases. 
As for please apps, I'm watching them. They're very rich in content. Apart from please apps, will you resort to other online media for publicity and promotion? At the moment, you sometimes sound alerts and make clarifications. But it depends on whether or not members of the public download your apps. So can you have a registration scheme for members of the public? The observatory has this service. If suddenly there are erroneous messages online which are rather appalling, for example, saying that very soon a bomb will be discovered somewhere, then can you have a pre-registration scheme for these apps so that members of the public can receive your information in advance? Under Secretary, the JPC would like to enrich and broaden its activities continuously. I refer Dr. Quartz's views to the police. As for online activities, what can the JPC do? They're already doing something for various districts. If they consider that there is a need, the JPC will do publicity in terms of behavior and conduct. For example, to teach you how to protect yourselves, how you should conduct yourselves online, what to do, what not to do, etc., etc. They've been doing this. As for a patrol team, it is to collect crime information and intelligence. In reality, in the cyber world, if JPC members come into contact with crime information and other intelligence, they will, of course, report us. But I'll also relay Dr. Quartz's opinion to the police. As for communicating with the public and the apps, their actual contents and modus operandi are reviewed annually by the police. The formulae that we're using are already the second generation formulae, which will be continuously updated. But I'll refer Dr. Quartz's views to the police. Mr. Lam Tai Fai. Fighting crime and crime the prevention are the responsibility of everybody because this society belongs to everyone, not just the police. And the police is now encouraging district engagement. I think that it's very important because we cannot have a limitless police force. So the public's participation and engagement will be very helpful when it comes to crime prevention. So police public cooperation is built on the relationship between the two. So for a DFCC, it should also help to enhance the relationship between the two. I also agree to that. Lately, Mr. Chak Su Tong, the former chairman of the IPCC, said that um, the relationship between the police and the public is um, at a record low, but I do not agree to that. So I would like to hear the police views on this. Do the police think that the relationship between the public and the police is at a historical low point now? And this would affect the cooperation between the public and the police and thus affecting uh, crime prevention. And for household policing plan, it's only implemented in Yunlong and Tin Shui Huai. It seems that it's been quite um, effective. So would this plan be expanded to other districts? Because this should also be very helpful in different districts. I would like to thank Mr. Lam for his questions. First of all, different people would have different comments on uh, police public relationships, so I respect different people's views. Well, in my view, I think the relationship between the, the, between the police and the public is good at the moment because the police cannot just rely on themselves to enforce the law if it if they do not have the support of the community and the people 
then the police cannot do a good job. And I have given members a number of figures, and actually the overall law and order situation in Hong Kong has seen a significant improvement. In particular, when it comes to serious crime, the figures have dropped significantly. We have been receiving intelligence from the public. Of course, each year is different, but I haven't seen a downward trend. Well, but the police have um, done a lot of investigations of uh, criminal cases with the help of the public. However, well, of course, there are some people who are are doing things against the police, but this are only isolated cases. I think the overall relationship between the police and the public has been quite good. And on different occasions, we have sent our liaison officers to attend them. For example, um, district um, meetings, etc. And I've heard a lot of voices supporting the Hong Kong police. Mr. Chiang Wa Fong, Hong Kong is one of the safest cities in the world, and I uh, really think um, that is. Uh, the real case, and I think the police have done a, a lot of work in this regard. Now, lately, we have seen a serious shooting case in Kaching Estate. The police have sent the special duties unit to tackle the crisis, and um, it has been very successful. But I want to know how come a person can keep uh, so many weapons in his home with several pistols and a large number of bullets. This is also a very important thing that the police should pay attention to. How come so many weapons can show up in an ordinary citizen's home? Um, this would become a serious threat in our society. So how can this kind of uh, crimes be prevented? Well, under Secretary, it seems that this is a digression, yet, yet um, I hope the Secret under Secretary can still answer this question. Uh, with regard to this criminal case, Jack, just happened and the weapons involved, the police attach a lot of importance to them. And now the police are carrying out investigation. We will try to find out the source of the weapons. Now, Hong Kong has very stringent laws concerning weapons and firearms. Anybody cannot keep firearms without a license. So when it comes to the control of firearms, I think Hong Kong has been doing a good job. Now, if you look at the number of cases, in the past three years, we have not had a single case involving firearms. So when we talk to other police forces in um, other countries, uh, they would also appreciate our work. Of course, the police will try its best to uh, look at the present case, try to find out the source of the weapon. And we have adopted a number of measures in preventing the imports of firearms. For example, the collection of intelligence. Uh, we, we, if we have good in intelligence, then we can target on the most sus suspicious people. And when it comes to uh, border controls, different disciplined forces of the government would cooperate to act as gatekeepers. And also international collaboration is very important because most of the time the weapons come from other countries. So international collaboration it's very important. We can get intelligence from other countries, and that will be very effective. 
and timely. And of course, we always communicate with our mainland counterparts. In this regard, the police and other disciplined forces have effective mechanisms. Well, Chairman, you may say that uh, I'm digressing from the topics we are discussing today. I still would like to ask uh, some more questions. Now, the case was actually live broadcast by TV on that day. So would that threaten the work of the special duties unit? Well, I've drawn a line and there are still two other members who would like to ask questions. So now I can only give members two minutes to ask questions and get answers. And then I will end the discussion of this item because we have been over running for more than 10 minutes. Mr. Charles Mock. Thank you, Chairman. Well, just now I heard uh, Dr. Cox's question and um, she talked about cyber patrol team. And I think this is alarming because it is like setting up a red guard online. I think now the um, cyber culture is already not that good because now um, people are fighting against each other online. Now, if the um, JPC becomes an online patrol team, it would threaten our freedom of speech. Actually, the Customs and Excise Department are actually doing this job. I actually agree with the um, Under Secretary. Now, you can train up the JPC members. They should be responsible for their own behaviors. But if you want to set up a cyber patrol team, then the, the JPC members will just be encouraged to collect unnecessary um, in, information or intelligence, and then a lot of trouble will be created, and it would become another Article 23 online. Thank you, Mr. Mock. For anything that's done online, no matter whether it's done by a member of the police or by a member of the public, I think you have to know this. That is, if he sees anything illegal online and if he reports that to the relevant authorities, he's just discharging his duty. So I think the crust of the issue is uh, if you are browsing on the internet, the most important thing is what you are browsing. If you are looking at illegal things, then um, reporting that behavior, reporting on that behavior may not be incorrect. Now, um, between 2013 to 2014, we have heard many cases concerning cruelty against cats, but not many of these cases have been cracked. I think you really have to rely on community people. Maybe you should send more officers to the Chinwan district, and um, the message against um, animal cruelty should be disseminated more broadly. Now, young people are also very interested in shooting micro movies, and many micro movies are very popular online. Um, you have um, your own YouTube channel, so why don't you um, organize some uh, micro movie competitions so as to encourage them to be more engaged? Now, maybe young people are even more familiar with new ways of um, committing offenses. So if you encourage them to make micro movies that disseminate such knowledge, that would be very helpful in fighting crimes. With regard to animal cruelty, the police have been sparing no efforts. And of course, the public support is very important. So other than education, if we can build 
good partner, build up with good partnership with the public. That is also very important. And you should go visit Chin Wan more often. Yes, I will reflect your views to the police force. With regard to micro micro movies, I'll ask Mr. Edwin Lam to give you more information. Well, let us discuss this later because now time is up and we should wrap up the discussion of agenda item four. We should move on to agenda item four. Five, creation of a chief superintendent of police post for the Cyber Security and Technology Crime Bureau. And after the discussion of this paper, I will ask if members support this paper to be submitted to the ESC. So the paper number is uh, 1621 bracket 05. Will the administration take us through this paper, please? Mr. John Lee, Chairman, I would like to um, consult the panel about the creation of a permanent chief in superintendent of police post of the Cyber Security and Technology Crime Bureau. Now, um, the internet is very popular and most people will use smartphones and tablets or uh, PCs. Uh, with the advancement of technology, Hong Kong is running a higher risk concerning cyber security. The Technology Crime uh, Division was first established in 2002 when there were 272 reports of technology crime. However, it has increased to 5,133 in 2013. In the past five years, the um, financial loss has increased from 45 million to 917 million. And also, there have been different ways and new methods of technology crimes. The Technology Crime Division under the Commercial Crime Bureau is responsible for preventing and detecting technology crime and responding to cyber security incidents. When the TCD was first established in 2002, there were only 272. Oh, there were only um, 90 something um, officers. There is a need for the police to upgrade the TCD to the new CSTCB, that is Cyber Security and Technology Crime Bureau. That is to be completed this year, within this year. We'll have long-term objectives and strategies to combat cyber crimes and review our security resources. The details are already set out under the six areas in paragraph three of the paper. The new CSTCB will be led by a CSP post, which have to have a dedicated experience and vision as well as knowledge and exposure. Therefore, when there are major cyber attack incidents, together with other police units, the CSTCB will be engaging in the effective collaboration and coordination among various local and international stakeholders in addressing technology, crime, and cybersecurity issues. Internationally, they have to attend meetings of the Interpol and other international organizations. So I urge members to support the creation of the CSP post. Thank you, Under Secretary. Apart from the Under Secretary for this item, we have the Principal Assistant Secretary for Security, Mrs. Millie Ng Kiang, and the Chief Superintendent from the Crime Commercial Bureau of the Police, Mr. Lawrence Wong. Let me see how many members would like to ask questions. Mr. Wong Yuk Man, Mr. Ma Fong Kwok, Ms. Claudia Mo, Ms. Emily Lau, Ms. Charles, Mr. Charles Mock, Mr. Chen Chi Chun, any more? Dr. Elizabeth Kwok, any more? Two, four, seven members. 
We still have one more item to go. That is about the unified screening mechanism, which will attract a lot of questions from members, I believe. So three minutes each for this item. I'll draw a line there. I won't allow any more members to speak because I have to ensure that there's ample time of discussion for the next item. Mr. Wong York Man, Mr. Chairman, I only have three minutes. I cannot finish what I want to say. I don't want any response. I just want to present my opinion. In principle, I agree that the police has to strengthen its ability to combat cyber crimes. In principle, I agree. But should they go it by way of manpower increase? We we'll have to discuss. First of all, I oppose this uh, CSP post and 74 non-directorate posts. And to transfer the original C TCD under the CCB to the CSTCB is an upgrading exercise, actually. That means in future it will be at the same level as the CCB. So they need one. CSP and 74 non-directorate posts. I oppose the proposals. The paper sets out a number of figures which were mentioned by the Under Secretary. Why do they need to establish the CSTCB? They gave us a great deal of figures. I won't repeat them. I have no doubt about these figures. In actual fact, the advancement of uh, information science and technology is ever advancing. So we'll get larger scales of cyber crimes. That's that will certainly happen. But it is ne is it necessary to upgrade the existing TCD and to form a CSTCB? I think the scale proposed is problematic. Look at the moment the TCB is under the CCB. Twenty officers increasing to ninety eight. And now you will have a very large establishment. Most complicated cyber crimes are commercial crimes. So the TCD should come under the CCB. That's a must. It's necessary to upgrade it. Otherwise, there will be a mismatch of resources and efficiency will go down. And then I'd like to ask whether you have the talents and professionals. You want to identify a CSP in the police. Will he be a professional? He is going to lead 74 non-directorate officers. Well, will he be coming back from overseas? Has he participated in relevant investigations? Does he have the professional knowledge? And then you talk about cyber security. For investigating, I'm interested in cyber attack, uh, timely auditing and prevention of cyber attack on major infrastructure facilities and to provide support and for major cyber incidents and technology crimes and security issues among the 70 odd people, how many can handle such issues for cyber attack? You have to provide us with data information. If you ask for this establishment, what sort of personnel will there be and will they be able to cope? Mr. Ma Mr. Ma Kwok, Mr. Chairman, three minutes is not enough. Mr. Ma Fong Kwok, please provide us with the paper. Otherwise, I'll still pursue this issue. Mr. Ma Fong Kwok, I have several questions. Number one, for the proposed establishment of the CSTCB, how will it be different from the CCB. What about division of work? What about stealing of passwords from banks? Which establishment will take care of it? It's not clear in the paper. And what about cyber attack by overseas governments? Will this new CSTCB adopt measures to target those crimes? Now you require the CSP to have professional police knowledge, exposure and vision, but not cyber knowledge and experience. Why so? Will there be suitable training for this person to ensure that he is properly equipped in terms of 
information technology. I personally support the proposed post and establishment, but whether or not it will be effective, I have uh, the two questions aforementioned. Under Secretary, first of all, about division of work, we don't have a scientific formula. It's not as simple as A is A, B is B. We mainly look at the degree of complication of the cyber crimes concerned. If uh, very sophisticated professional knowledge, exposure, and vision are involved, then we need the CSP of the CSTCB. But for simpler crimes that only result in commercial losses, as mentioned by Mr. Ma, then the CCB may take them up. Well, they're all under the crime wing. So it will be decided by the crimes wing who will be responsible. It really depends on the complicatedness and severity of the cyber technology involved in the cyber crime concerned. What about cyber attacks by overseas governments? Mr. Ma, for this new CSTCB, it will disregard the status of the offender. So long as there is an offender, then we'll try to collect evidence and the tactics involved. And it is the responsibility of the CSTCB to trace and track down on the offender. But whether it's really a cyber crime, it depends on the investigation results and judgment. Ms. Claudia Mo, thank you, Chairman. The pleas is now proposing a large scale establishment for cyber crimes. From the figures you give us, your proposal is reasonable because now everybody has a mobile phone. But of course, these are commercial crimes. If it involves money, the CCB will be responsible. If it is a criminal offence, if intimidation is involved, then of course the Crimes Bureau will take that up. But now we're talking about the fifth right, that is the cyber right. We have a, a very famous, we have several famous brands. Most users will make use of their cyber services. Well, if this media disseminate untrue information, so is this commercial, criminal, or purely civil acts that lead to public unrest. Now, the pleas would like to adopt a large-scale establishment to consider cyber crimes. It's just like state security. Just a couple of months ago, the mainland authorities announced the establishment of a state security committee chaired by Chairman Xi Jinping to look into cyber crimes, and they also oversee political security. So will this new bureau also oversee political security? And the secretary, the police always act in accordance with the laws. So the police will only consider whether a certain act breaches Hong Kong laws. If it breaches the laws of Hong Kong, the police is duty-bound to take action as regards whether the act itself involves a particular area. The police will not consider the motive but to the act itself and whether or not there is sufficient evidence for bringing the case to court. Now, there are two gatekeepers. Apart from the police itself, the DOJ will look at the evidence to see whether there's a breach of the laws of Hong Kong. And the other gatekeeper is the courts with professional and fair and just judgments. Will you look into the civil cases as well? 
you will consult the DOJ as well, right? So that's tantamount to white terror. The police will only target criminal acts. We only have statutory powers to handle criminal offences. Civil cases will belong to the general public. Ms. Emily Lau, for the last item on the agenda, our colleagues asked about uh, Mr. Jack Xiu Tong, the outgoing chairman of the IPCC. Please, public relationships are very poor at the moment. And now we have this proposal. Well, there were originally 26 officers. That has been increased to 98. And now you propose a further increase to 180. Well, we understand that you have to handle a lot of crimes. But with this huge operation, huge proposal, members of the public will panic. They'll be afraid. In the past tense, 272 cases jumping to 5,133. So what sort of crimes are these? And just now your Dr. Elizabeth Quartz suddenly mentioned Cyber Patrol. She is queuing up to speak. Is it that the DAB is appealing for Cyber Patrol? Members of the public are very worried about these. Mr. Snowden was here, and the whole USA was under his surveillance, and now many people are already worried that they're being surveilled by you. And you're now trying to bring in more energy for yourselves. So what should happen then? Under Secretary, we explained very clearly in the paper that the TCB will be upgraded to the CSTCB. The objective is summarized in paragraph 3 of the paper under several areas. Perhaps I should try to summarize. To upgrade it to the CSTCB is to enhance its capacity to investigate into criminal behavior and to enhance jurisprudence to act against crimes. And more importantly, vetting of infrastructure facilities like the MTL, the banking systems, and so forth. We assist these companies to vet their security and contingency plans to see whether they're up to international standard. I would like to ask the Under Secretary whether the people's freedom of expression will be affected. Well, just now when I answered Ms. Claudia Mo, I also mentioned it. Uh, for the police to act, it has to be based on the law. Now, if you think that um, security is undermined, then you uh, will take action. So for that action, if it's illegal, no matter whether it's online or offline, it's still illegal, then um, it will require the action of the police. Mr. Charles Mark, Chairman, with regard to this CSTCB and its uh, work, and actually, after reading the paper, I'm very confused. Now, of course, uh, when you state such things in a paper, it seems that um, they are very normal and uh, you want to uh, carry out more um, active investigation, etc., and you will be um, doing audits, etc. Now, lately, I have heard about this. Several universities uh, said that um, they have received threats of um, cyber attacks. As for the um, organization supporting um, democratic movements in China, its website has also been threatened. So have the police done anything? And it's um, are the police still using SP? As for malware, I have heard a lot of cases concerning malware, and the police have not done anything. And you're saying that you will be cooperating with overseas um, counterparts. Would that include 
um, your counterparts on the mainland. Now, of course, if somebody has committed um, a crime, of course, you should uh, arrest him. But I do not see you putting resources in the really needy areas. Now, you have given us a list of your jobs. So what about the percentages? A lot of people are concerned about uh, cyber censorship, and they are afraid that freedom of speech will be threatened. So can you tell us more about uh, the job descriptions? And I would like to um, have a breakdown of the different jobs. For example, at point four and six, you are saying that you will be uh, monitoring activities which may um, affect the police work. So would that also include um, the Occupy Central Movement? If you do not give me clear explanation, I find it very difficult to support your application. Now, if anyone thinks that um, he's um, cyber activities may be threatened. We would uh, welcome him to report to us. As for uh, cooperating with overseas counterparts, it is very important because for um, cyber security, it always involves other countries. So how about universities and um, other pro-democracy organizations' websites being attacked. Now, we are told that the number of technology crimes has increased significantly, and the financial loss has also increased. But can you give us a breakdown? We need more detailed statistics. And also, a lot of people are very worried about this. Now, you are upgrading the TC to the CSTCB. This is to tie in with the um, new copyright law. So um, the police force is doing this. Is this related to the new law? Well, of course, we were told that this is not a cyber article 23, but now you are enhancing manpower in this area. So would it become a cyber article 23? Now we already have cyber police, so you don't have to be surprised. And what kinds of crimes will you be investigating into? Will you be patrolling uh, different websites, and will there be cyber undercovers and in Taiwan we have seen this kind of examples they have an article 235 and they would uh, pose as hookers or uh, prostitute patronizers online and if anybody responds to them then these people will be arrested and for naked chat um, the number of cases has increased by 695 percent in one year so have you done any work in this area now for cyber security centers Now, we are trying to upgrade the TCD to the CSTCB. Actually, this old and new units will be doing the same thing. That is, they will be targeting cybersecurity and technology crime. Just now, uh, we were asked whether a certain organization um, its website has been attacked, whether we have done anything. But now we are targeting uh, infrastructures now. So we are uh, working for important organizations or um, companies and facilities in society. So if any organizations think that they are under attack, they should report to us. I think everybody knows that technology 
is uh, very important and very influential nowadays. So, um, Mr. Chen Chichun also uh, mentioned that the number of offenses in this area has increased significantly in the past years, and I'm sure the trend will go up in the coming years. So I support that uh, the TCD be upgraded to the CSTCB. So now you will have a new uh, commander and a new bureau. I hope that with this new tools, Hong Kong can continue to be one of the safest cities in the world. So uh, will there be enough talents working for this new bureau? And also when it comes to publicity and education, what kind of plans do the police have in the future? And the secretary, now with regard to talents, for the existing TCD, it has a number of doctors and masters working for it, and there are about 10 officers who are recognized by the Interpol as trainers. They are already training um, police officers in different countries, for example, South Korea, Thailand, and Singapore. Hong Kong TCD members have been training relevant officers in these countries. So they are internationally uh, recognized people. And also there is an international organization called SENSE. It is responsible for um, technology training. And uh, the police force of Hong Kong has also sent officers to attend its courses. After setting up the CSTCB, how can we further protect our public in terms of cybersecurity? Now, um, it will be doing more proactive work. For example, it will be looking at new uh, means of offenses. Um, in the past, they um, just carry out study on an ad hoc basis, but in the future, this will become an established practice. For example, they will be looking at uh, malwares and worms. And also, they will be looking at DDoS and what are the new methods. And they will also be looking at um, Frankenstein computers, etc. I have drawn a line, and Mr. Yu Suing as well as Lang Kuo Hong would also like to ask questions. So each member will be given one minute. Mr. Yu Suing. Thank you, Chairman. I would like to ask about this new bureau. Would its work involve um, credit cards and a uh, collection of intelligence? And now uh, there will be 180 more officers working on for this uh, bureau. So will you uh, recruit? all of them in one go. Well, these people will not be doing eavesdropping. And for a credit card, well, most of the work will be done by the Commercial Crime Bureau. However, if uh, high technology is involved, and if the investigation officers would have to understand technology thoroughly when they look into the case, then the CSTCB would get involved. And of course, um, the new bureau will also be targeting hackers. Lang Hong, well, if there are no talents, then you can go to Shanghai, because the United States have accused a certain unit um, in Shanghai, saying that it attacks um, the US every day. Now, why don't you give us the relevant information? I just uh, picked this up from the floor. It's from the DAB. 
B um, is about uh, follow-up questions um, of the Security Bureau. Um, I do not have such a document. I just picked it up from the floor. Is a follow-up questions provided by the Security Bureau. This is from the DAB Research Unit. Now, if you give me these documents, then I don't need to employ one more assistant. So I would like to ask members if you support this paper. Do you think this paper should be submitted to the ESC? Any objection? Any objection? Chairman, well, many of us has, have asked for more information. For those who are in favor of submitting this paper to ESC, please raise your hands. Five. For those who object, please raise their hands. Two, three, please raise your hands. Now, if that is the case, then this paper will be referred to the ESC. And now let's move on to agenda item six. I would like to remind members that they should not be taking papers from other members. This is immoral. Yes, I know that you picked it up from the floor, but actually that's not the case. You get it from the seats of another member, and you dare to speak aloud on it. Okay, now let's talk about the implementation of the unified screening mechanism. As for this agenda item, the paper number is CB bracket two sixteen twenty one bracket oh six. Uh, In attendance for this discussion, we have the Se Secretary for Security, Mr. Lai Tong Kwok, the Principal Assistant Secretary for Security, Mr. Billy Wu, and the Assistant Director of Immigration, Mr. Fong Pat Ho. Secretary? Please introduce the paper to us. Well, on the 3rd of March this year, the Unified Screening Mechanism was implemented, USM. I will introduce the details to you. In December 2012, as well as March 2013, the Court of Final Appeal ruled that as long as the Director of Immigration maintains the practice of taking into account humanitarian considerations having regard to a person's claimed fear of persecution before executing a person's removal or deportation to another country, he is required to, before deportation, make a decision on the claim and the procedures have to attain a high degree of fairness. The vetting or the screening process will be expanded to cover the risk areas that I mentioned. Besides, the procedures of the USM as well as those under the Convention Against Torture are basically the same and have been implemented for over a year. The relevant stakeholders, like the duty lawyers, non-government organizations who are concerned about the claimants, have a good level of knowledge of the procedures. A form has to fill up to state the reason for the claim and the reasons why he is afraid of being deported back to the place of origin, including his own experience in his own country for the fear. And then an interview will be organized by the Immigration Department to analyze and allow the person to present his reasons. Apart from the reasons and evidence produced by the claimant himself, 
information from the jurisdiction concerned, local and overseas precedents will be considered, and all the details for the decision would be set out. An appeal can be lodged against the Immigration Department's decision such that the judiciary will make a final judgment. Therefore, the claimant will have all reasonable opportunities to state his case and provide evidence. And throughout the procedure, he'll be supported by public funds. And duty lawyers will be there to assist him so as to attain the highest standard of fairness. The UNHCR's role might have been misunderstood for the USM is not to impose the Convention on Refugees. We are not going to take over the work of the UNHCR. The Hong Kong SARG has never and has no plan to affirm a person's refugee status. Therefore, the Convention on Refugees has never been implemented in Hong Kong and this will not be changed. For the claimant concerned, even though the claim is substantiated, the SARG will not give him a refugee status, will only provide a temporary refuge for the claimant. That is, temporarily, the person will not be repatriated to the place of origin, but he will not be given the permanent residency status. Once the risk is gone, we'll make arrangement for the claimant to leave Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a, mo is a small place with a dense population. We're a regional, we are a regional transport hub. Therefore, we're one of the major destinations of illegal immigrants. Therefore, immigration measures must remain open to attract talents and professionals from all over the world. Hong Kong as a society of the rule of law, we have to respect the court's ruling in screening claims of non-repatriation. We must make sure that we have a, an effective mechanism to allow people who may be exposed to a high risk in their place of origin to stay in Hong Kong. This challenge is not simple. The USM has just started. Under the screening mechanism of the Convention on Torture or Convention Against Torture, I believe the mechanism will continue to operate effectively and where and when appropriate will conduct a review. Without affecting the high degree of fairness, we will make sure that the screening procedure will be effective. Questions are welcome from members. Thank you, Mr. Lai. Some members have signified their wish to speak. They include Mr. Ma Fung Kwok, Dr. Fernando Chung, Mr. Long Kwok Hong, Mr. Yu Si Wing, Mr. Michael Ten, Mr. Kwok Wai Kang, Mr. Dennis Kwok, Mr. James Cho, our Deputy Chairman, Dr. Elizabeth Kwok, Mr. Paul Zay. Any more? Any more? Then three minutes each. Mr. Ma Fung Kwok. Thank you, Chairman. In actual fact, the SARG, in order to implement the court's ruling and to maintain our humanitarian role, as the Secretary said, we paid a high price. Economically, we spent quite a great deal on that. Since 2009 up to February this year, what's the matter? I don't know. Somebody is disturbing me. Mr. Chairman, just now my DAB paper was inside this kit, this folder. It has disappeared. I believe uh, that's what Mr. Long Kok Hong was holding in his hand. I did not take it out. Why has it disappeared? If it is a DAB paper, why are you still holding on to it? Should you not return it to me? Well, the Security Bureau has provided that to you. Well, Mr. Long Kok Hong, would you please return the paper to him? 
Is your name on the paper? I've uh, written a Mr. Long's name on it. If you continue to act like that, I'll invite you to leave. Well, I have written on the paper. This is a paper picked up by Long Hair. All right, would you please ask them whether that's their paper? Well, you cannot continue with uh, such acts. You took it from that seed, but you said that you picked it up. You're actually s stealing it. You've stolen it. Mr. Long Kwok Hong, I'm not going to argue with you anymore. I won't make a ruling now. If you want me to handle the issue, Mr. Ang Lang saying, Mr. Ang Lang saying, well, let me handle the matter. I have returned it to you. Does that belong to you? I think you saw DAB's logo there. I don't believe you do not know DAB's logo. Please don't speak any more. Otherwise, I invite you to leave. You have not picked it up. You have stolen it, Mr. Ma Fung Kwok. A point of order, Mr. Chairman. I don't understand. We don't. Well, our members don't sit at fixed seats here. Well, even if I'm to leave this room, I won't write my name, James Toe, on my paper. If I've left the papers on my seat, that may be treated as abandoned papers. Well, but he hasn't left his seat yet. If you're interested, I can talk to you later. Well, you shouldn't casually say that somebody. Has stolen something. That's my view. He has also heard me. If you do not understand the situation, well, due to time constraints, we have to continue. Mr. Marfan Kok, Mr. Chairman, can I start afresh? Yes, start afresh. Mr. Chairman, I was looking at the figures since 2009 to now, 4,000 odd claims were completed only. Twenty-two substantiated, lower than zero point four percent, proving that a lot of these claims had been abusing our resources and the claimants' rights. I'd like to ask the government a question. For such abuses, apart from the claimants, I believe many lay organisations and members of the legal profession have been assisting them. For the rejected cases, what about the reasons? Are they public information, such that those in the legal profession and those who are assisting the claimants will understand the situation and will not casually assist such claimants to lodge a claim? That will guard against abuses and save a great deal of public money. So, has the administration provided such information to them? The USM has been in place for quite some time for NGOs and humanitarian organizations. Do they know clearly the standards adopted by the SARG? To avoid unnecessary claims for a stay, and sometimes interviews were arranged, but the claimants were absent. Do we have any mechanism to deal with them, Secretary? For any claimant, we provide detailed explanation in writing. However, we do not make such information public. Number one, every case is different. Secondly, the family members of the claimant may be in the place of origin. So, if we make public the information, doubts may be triggered in the place of origin, which may affect the family members. What about precedents? Well, will the information be disclosed if they've gone to the appeal board? The information will not be made public, but if they seek a judicial review, the information will all be made public. 
and we did have quite some judicial review cases. You asked whether those who assisted them understand the situation. In fact, for each and every claim, there are clear rules and regulations for substantiation. For those who participated in the process for the workers in the legal profession, they've received quite some training so they understand the situation. Dr. Fernando Chao, Mr. Chairman, if the government has some thoughts in mind but would like to ask their friendly political parties to ask questions to say that those who are assisting the claimants are abusing the mechanism, then both internally and externally, this is an ugly phenomenon. I don't know whether the paper concerned just now was true or false, but this is very low standard practice. We have thousands of such cases. The screening procedure was rather long because in the past we had a number of mechanisms. So now it's good to have a unified mechanism, the USM. But I hope you won't smear or badmouth the claimant saying that they all abused the mechanism. I do not believe that each and every of these thousands of claimants would like to get some benefits from us. Throughout the world, in some jurisdictions, there are suppression in terms of religion, politics, and so forth. It's our international obligation under signed international conventions to assist them. Yes, uh, we do not take over refugees from the UNHCR, but then under the Convention Against Torture, we have certain obligations. And senior government officials have mentioned obligations to be honored by us. And the UNESCO has also been signed by us. We've also got our own proposals for this paper, but we have a tight schedule today. Now, with the implementation of the USM, new claimants had been confused. You have opened files for those who have already lodged a claim, but for the new claimants, where can they obtain the forms? There are a lot of legal terms in the forms and documents to be filled out. Can you have more user-friendly leaflets to advise the claimants how to start? Mr. Lam Hong, you accuse me of stealing, but I think that if a bureau secretly sends questions to certain members, that is really ugly. I'm not targeting anyone else. I'm targeting DAB. Why don't you send me those questions? You can help me so that I don't have to read so many documents. Well, don't think that I'm targeting DAB. I'm targeting the Bureau. If the Bureau does not send these questions to the DAB, how can the DAB get such questions? Did Chang Chi Kuang start this practice? Well, I am not targeting DAB now, but why do you provide DAB with those questions? Why don't you send those questions to me? Well, s sometimes you are doing your job well. I have talked to you about mainlanders, and you did that job well. But this practice is really unacceptable. Now, if we have 
universal suffrage that we would have a minister here talking to us. However, under the present system, you should come up with another method because the DAB is not the ruling party. So why should it help you? You have all misunderstood me. I am not accusing DAB. I am asking whether those questions are provided by the Bureau. You should not do this. Well, you can appoint a member of the DAB to be the secretary, just like Greg So. And that now you are providing questions to the DAB that is not acceptable. The only thing you can do is appoint a member of the DAB as a secretary or under secretary. Well, if there is a coalition government, the practice would be different. And we can have a minister of labor, and if he does his doesn't do his job, then he should be asked to resign. So you are, a principal government official. You have to answer me. Have you provided those questions to the AB? Yes or no. If you have done that, you have to tell me. Just tell me yes or no. I now do not have enough time to ask other questions. Well, I need that answer, yes or no. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Yu Si Wing. There are just five alphabets, Y, E, S, or N, O. Mr. Yu Si Wing. Chairman, on our desk, there are always loads of papers. I also have to attend the meeting next door. If another member walks by and takes my papers, then it is tantamount to stealing. I am a newcomer in this council. I think councillors should know the law better, whether their the behavior is right or wrong. They should know themselves, and I do not to sub I do not subscribe to such kind of behavior. Hong Kong is a very small city, and we have a lot of population, and we have over seven thousand. Uh, claims in this regard at the moment, but Hong Kong has to shoulder its international responsibility. That is why it has to look at this non refoulement claims. And the government is putting forward a new mechanism called the USM. So I would like to know more about the screening mechanism. How long does it take? How and how stringent is it when it's compared to other countries' practices? And after the court makes a ruling, How is this kind of ruling compared to other countries? Is it more stringent or more lenient? I don't think it's that simple to make such a comparison because each country or each uh, city has to face its own situations and problems, and they may be located in different parts of the world. Now, for torture claims, now the uh, time um, limit is 28 days. And for the new mechanism, is we would give the claimants 49 days to fill out the claim forms. When we look at other major countries in the world, um, this period is actually longer. Well, in the past, it was 28 days. Well. The law was drafted at that time, and then we discussed with members of this council, and members accepted uh, the allowance, the time allowance of 28 days. Uh, for Canada, it's also 28 days in the past, but in December 2012, they cut it to 15 days. As for the UK, in 2007, it was 10 days, and then it was. The 10 days were cancelled, and they didn't ask the claimants to fill out a form. They um, had interviews instead. Now, for this new mechanism, it has been in place um, for a while, and on the average, the claimants needed 30 
five days. In the past, um, we just gave them. Well, in the past, um, the average was、uh, twenty-seven days. So we want it to be fair to both parties. We are also trying to、um, work as fast as possible, Mr. Michael Tian. Well, from '93 up to now, how many claims have been successful? Do you have the figure, Immigration Department? Up to now, 23 claims have been substantiated. How about number of、uh, applications? Thirteen, almost thirteen thousand. Since two o o four, so since two o o four, there have been over ten thousand applications, and only twenty of them have been substantiated. So, are those applicants still in Hong Kong? Some of them are still in Hong Kong. So, over nine thousand nine hundred claimants have been staying in Hong Kong for over ten years. From nineteen ninety two onwards, the Convention Against Torture、um, has been implemented in Hong Kong, and over thirteen thousand people have made such claims, and、uh, thousands of people have already left Hong Kong after two thousand and four. There have been a number of court cases, and we have been making improvements to the screening mechanism all the time. For example, in two thousand and nine. We have an enhanced、um, torture claim mechanism. We have handled over 4,000 cases, and 22 cases have been substantiated. And before 2009, there was one case that was substantiated. So from 2009, you have handled over 4,000 cases, and only 20 cases have been substantiated. Right? Yes, 22. So for the Three thousand nine hundred and eighty claimants. How much legal fees has been spent on them? Now, of course,、uh, these people were in different situations. Now, some of their claims have been rejected by the Im immigration department. They may、uh, have lodged an appeal or appeal, or they may have、um, sought judicial review. How about the legal fee budget? Now, for the Uh, publicly funded legal assistance each year is ninety million dollars. So it's funded by the government, and the three thousand odd claimants、uh, have been using these legal assistance. Right? Do、so、you have to subsidize the living other than the legal assistance?、Uh, because for these claimants,、um, under the law, they cannot work in Hong Kong. So we do not want them to become destitute, and we—that's why we are providing them with、uh, humanitarian aid. So how much each year? It's about two hundred million dollars each year, and ninety million dollars、uh, legal assistance. So this is what the present situation is, Mr. Kwaweka. Thank you, Chairman. Michael Chen has. Ask some very important questions. A lot of money has been spent on them. Paragraph 11 of the paper mentions that if the、uh, claimant has a physical or mental condition, and that is in dispute, and that is relevant to the consideration of his non-refoulement claim, then.、Um, The claimants may have to take a physical examination. So, under this mechanism, how many percent of the claimants would make such a claim, and how many claimants have undergone physical examinations, and、uh, how many of them have been refused physical examinations? I do not have the figures in hand. However, I can.、Um, Let you know about this concept. Each year, we handle about 1,500 to 2,000 cases. As for physical examination, is about、um, dozens of them each year.、Uh, first of all, the physical examination has to be relevant to the consideration of his non-refoulement claim, and second, the case officer of the immigration. 
Department if he has different views or from the claimants concerning his physical or mental condition, then a physical examination would be needed. If his physical or mental condition is accepted by both the claimants and the immigration department, then no physical examination would be needed. So the number of cases concerning physical examination is not that high. So for those dozens of physical examinations, uh, how many of them are affirmative? That is, um, after the physical examination, the case um, is substantiated up to now zero. How much cost are we talking about? Uh, we do not have the exact figures right now because we always ask the Department of Health or the hospital authority to help us. So um, it's very di difficult for us to calculate the cost. Any other questions, Mr. Dennis Kwok? Chairman, uh, with regard to this, has the Bureau provided information or questions to certain uh, political parties, and the other members do not have this information. Now, sometimes we may uh, talk to certain members of the council, so there may be exchanges of information, and s some members may not be too familiar with this topic, and if after reading the paper they want to get further information from us, of course we will provide him with that information. Well, I hope that in the future, if there are questions or information like this, then the secretary should do it in a fairer manner. Um, he should not favor certain members. I hope that this kind of practice would not recur in the future. Now, um, have you read the letters from the Bar Association and the Law Society of Hong Kong? I was disappointed just now that some colleagues said that certain frontliners had abused the system. I don't know what information or evidence uh, these colleagues have such that they can say that there are abuses. The Bar Association mentioned a great deal of problems in their submission. They asked for a review as soon as possible together with the frontliners and the legal profession such that supplementary information or supplementary guidelines can be published to clarify certain issues. I'd like the Secretary to respond to the submissions from the Law Society and the Bar Association, in particular in relation to paragraphs 24, 25, and 26. I'd like to ask a lot of questions. Some frontliners would like uh, to ask questions via us. but. I don't have enough time, so I've drafted some written questions for submission to the Bureau through you. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm submitting these questions. I'd like to have answers to my questions just now from the Bureau. If I heard Mr. Kwok correctly, he's referring to their letter dated the 14th of May. On the 30th of May, we sent a detailed reply in writing, and the letter was copied to the panel on security. We'll, we'll refer your questions to the secretary for responses. Mr. James Stowe and then Dr. Elizabeth Quatt. Mr. Chairman, the secretary was not just providing information to members. He's providing questions to teach them what to ask. Did our colleagues ask you to teach them how to ask questions? Secretary, in our exchanges, we touched upon all issues. 
after receiving the information, in what way members will ask questions or which questions to ask are the decisions for members. I cannot request or ask councillors to ask questions. Did you suggest those questions to them or the colleague told you he didn't know what to ask and asked you to teach him? In our communication with councillors, councillors may have viewpoints and ask us for explanation. They may ask us for more explanation. In the course of communication, we understood that some councillors would like to know more as to how the councillors concerned would like to ask questions and how to ask questions in relation to his own concerns is for the councillors themselves to decide. Well, the, there are two different things. It's, of course, right for you to provide information to them. I do not agree with them. Mr. Dennis Crock. Well, if a certain member asks the government for certain information, the government may not need to copy the answers to all members. But then, have you been suggesting questions to members? Of course, members can eventually decide not to ask those questions. If the Bureau was doing that, it's really unreasonable. If it was that member who asked that be done, that member was unreasonable. But you should reject that request. And Secretary, if you learned of this incident and allowed that to happen, you may have to resign. I'd like to thank Mr. Toe for his remarks. Let me repeat what I said. If members are concerned about a particular issue, we'll try to explain as to how questions should be put is for members to decide and handle. Mr. Chairman, let me say this. Under this USM, I maintain my present position, which I told the government before. Torture is subject to a statutory mechanism. For non-statutory reasons, if they are mixed up with statutory reasons, sooner or later, you'll have trouble. Dr. Elizabeth Quatt. Mr. Chairman, in Hong Kong, on the basis of humanitarian grounds, as an international citizen, we're duty bound to offer assistance to certain claimants. In recent times, there was this rape case involving a claimant raping a local female. After that incident, I received a lot of inquiries by telephone and by emails. Well, that's the overall worry of the public of Hong Kong. Such worries are not unreasonable. The worries include the following. Is there a loophole in the present mechanism such that we cannot handle the arrivals? Secondly, Hong Kong is a small place. We now have 13,000 odd claims, but they had been lingered. They had been lingering on for a long time, and we haven't been able to resolve all of them. And in the long run, will Hong Kong be able to cope? Besides, they're worried that for those who are staying in Hong Kong, before lodging a claim, will they be working as illegal workers and security-wise? How can we ensure that they will not be engaged in criminal acts because there were such acts? So members of the public are worried. So I'd like to know the position and opinion of the Bureau. Is there any loophole? in the present mechanism, how can we set the mind of the public at ease? Secretary, Hong Kong is a place of the rule of law. No matter who is in Hong Kong or whatever status he is in, he has to abide by the law. 
For those who are temporarily staying in Hong Kong waiting for screening, he has to abide by the law. And under the law, these people are not allowed to work. If there's anything illegal, our law enforcement agencies will enforce the law. For example, we have special squads uh, to handle illegal workers with sudden rates and checks. In 2013, or from 2009 to 2013, we arrested 2,600 such illegal immigrants and overstayed persons. They had been arrested due to certain offences. So thousands of people were arrested. Yes, uh, we do provide them with assistance because they cannot work, but will not sit back and do nothing if they breach the law. Mr. Pode, Mr. Chairman will do some calculation. 23 successful cases. If you do a division, total 13,000, so is 0.0018% of success. If you look at other jurisdictions, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh taking up 61%. For these 23 successful cases, what about the distribution under those three jurisdictions? Do you have the figures? Secondly, may I refer you to paragraph 19 of the paper. Hong Kong insists that will not assist the UNHCR to handle any refugee cases. No arrangements for staying will be arranged, will be made. But the UNHCR has stopped the screening process. They leave the screening to us. So Hong Kong is bearing that procedure. UNHCR only make referrals for successful cases. And therefore, we're shouldering part of the cost for the UNHCR. Now, we are concerned about Occupy, Occupy Central. In fact, Occupy Central has started a footbridge leading to the Star Ferry Pier had been occupied by ISS protesters. They took up uh, most of the road for over 110 days already. ISS was accused of corruption. If that's the case, if they handle welfare issues for the refugees, if they don't perform well, the SWD had to do more. We may have to bear their costs. So may I know the details of that incident? Secretary, first of all, I'd like to tell Mr. Zhe that after the implementation of the USM, the UNHCR has stopped its procedures. Otherwise, there will be duplication of similar claims. In the past, there were criticisms that a claimant would be able to lodge different claims at different times. As a result, there's delay. For the Immigration Department, before repatriating a person, that person has to lodge a claim personally. So we reached consensus with the UNHCR on the existing arrangement. You mentioned the footbridge with refugees demonstrating. I understand the situation. For their complaints, the SWD had looked into them. ISS is an internationally credible organization, so we're confident in the handling of the incident. Many members have spoken. I cannot entertain a second round. We have to finish by 4.45 because we have to hand the venue to another meeting. Second round, I understand Dr. Fernando John wants to speak. Mr. Chairman, during the course of this meeting, 
The Secretary for Security said that he had exchanges with some members. There were opinion, and sometimes information was provided to members. I'd like to point out that I wrote to the Sec Security Bureau asking for a meeting with them on USM, but then they met with other political parties and other members and even provided opinion and questions. Why is it so? Two minutes, Mr. Lang Chicha. I have to f conclude this meeting by 4.45. Mr. Chairman, I have to clarify. Well, the paper was actually in the folder. It went to another member. Although these seats are not fixed, but if personal documents are placed on these seats and some colleagues thought that they could casually take away the papers, it would not be all right. So would you please follow this up under the rules of procedure? For the Security Bureau, the DAB has always kept in close exchange and communication with the Security Bureau. If we discover questions from papers, we'll discuss with the Bureau, and questions were asked for internal reference. But those questions were not directly provided by the Security Bureau. But this practice has been misunderstood as a feeding of information from the Security Bureau to us. So number one, I'd like you to clar clarify this. Number two, I'd like you to follow up on my complaint. Well, under my jurisdiction, I cannot entertain further questions and remarks. We have to finish. I handle your complaint. Any other business? No other business? Meeting adjourned. Thank you.